Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, in a landmark ruling, Korea's constitutional court strikes down a law banning adultery, saying it infringed upon personal freedom. As we mark President Park Geun-hye entering her third year in office, we have a special report on her foreign policy successes, failures and the challenges that lay ahead. Plus, the Islamic State militant known as Jihadi John is identified as Mohammed M. Wazi, a former university student from a respectable London family. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Friday, February 27th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, Korea's top court has revoked a 60-year-old adultery law under which cheating husbands and wives could be jailed, saying it's unconstitutional. Striking down the law on Thursday, the Constitutional Court said preserving marriage was up to the free will of the people. Our Shin Se-min reports. Having an affair will no longer be a criminal offense. That's the ruling issued by Korea's Constitutional Court on Thursday, following four previous appeals, the last being in 2008. It's based on the argument that the law infringes on an individual's right to privacy and that extramarital affairs should be regulated by civil law, not criminal law. The decision has raised a question of whether some 5,500 people charged with infidelity since 2008 will file for a retrial or a compensation. And one uncertainty that's been expressed is that affairs could become more prevalent. Adultery is still illegal. It is still a civil case. The criminal court is leaving the matter to the parties directly involved. The law had made marital infidelity a criminal offense punishable by up to two years in prison, but only a small percentage of those deemed guilty were actually jailed. And in recent years, enforcement of the law also waned as charges were often dropped. Kim Gwang Sam, a former Seoul district prosecutor, believes that abolishing the law was a move in the right direction that won't necessarily lead to a surge in extramarital affairs. Other nations that have struck down anti-cheating laws, such as France or Germany, didn't experience a major social breakdown after decriminalizing adultery. As the ruling largely reflects a rapidly changing Korea breaking away from the traditional conservative norms, experts say it was a necessary move for private freedoms. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, on the second day of a three-day questioning session at the National Assembly on Thursday, lawmakers grilled the newly appointed Prime Minister and government officials on the economy. The concerns ranged from snowballing household debt to welfare programme funding. Our Park ji reports. Lawmakers fired questions at government officials on the administration's economic plans for tackling pressing issues such as skyrocketing household debt, deepening income polarization and stagnant economic growth. In the hot seat was the new Prime Minister Lee Wan Gu and eight others, including the nation's finance, trade and science ministers. Korea's household debt currently stands at some 993 billion U.S. dollars. Consumption has been frozen and income levels haven't increased. Households are facing the burden of higher living expenses, while companies have stopped investing. The economy has stopped its virtuous cycle of growth. For the past two years, the Park Geun-hye administration has attempted to strengthen the economy and will keep pushing the necessary reforms forward. I expect we'll have visible results soon. Economists say they agree with the government's strategy of focusing on reforms to revive the economy, but say the timing was a little late. The administration should have focused on reforms from the very start of its term because reforms can bear fruit in the long term. As the administration now has a low approval rating, it could face obstacles to its reforms. 
the government deficit and the administration's pledge to expand welfare without raising taxes were other issues criticized at the assembly. The session will continue until Friday, and the last day's focus will be on social and cultural issues. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, in the final of our three-part series, looking at what's ahead for President Park in her third year in office, today we're going to focus on foreign policy. Korea is enjoying improved ties with China and the U.S., but has made little progress on inter-Korean relations. For a look at what went right and what went wrong in diplomacy and the challenges that lie ahead, here's our Hwang Sang-hee. A stronger alliance with the United States and a budding friendship with China are two of President Park Geun-hye's most notable diplomatic achievements. The signing of a free trade agreement deepened Seoul's economic cooperation with Beijing, and the two neighbors have opened up military channels. But experts say South Korea may find itself in a difficult position between the two great powers. And I would say right now, uh, the missile defense issue and the question of THAAD deployment in South Korea is one place where you can watch this tension really bubbling right up to the surface. Despite President Park's pledge to improve inter-Korean ties, tensions remain high. Some blame her lack of flexibility for fizzled momentum, like last year's reunions for war-separated families and a surprise visit to the South by a high-level North Korean delegation. Even the unification minister recently admitted that the Park administration's signature trust politique which focuses on building trust with the North through dialogue and cooperation, failed to make any significant progress. But there are doubts that a fresh approach will be any better as long as Pyongyang maintains its belligerence. She can try some things to elicit that reciprocity from the North, but until they have a more cooperative attitude, it's very difficult to achieve positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Another task is getting Japan to fully acknowledge its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. With relations with Tokyo at their worst, experts say Seoul should seek practical cooperation in areas like security and the economy. Since foreign affairs is an area that requires policies with a long-term perspective, experts say it's too early to judge whether the Park administration's diplomacy has been a success or a failure. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, there was more diplomacy on Thursday as the leaders of Korea and the Czech Republic elevated their relationship to a strategic partnership following summit talks in Seoul. Now, this comes as the two countries celebrate 25 years of diplomatic ties. Che Yusun reports. The Czech Republic is now Korea's 20th strategic partner, a sign that over the past 25 years, the two sides have recognized the rising importance of their political and economic cooperation and that their people have a lot in common. On Thursday, Korea and the East Central European nation signed three deals to reflect their strengthened partnership, agreeing to periodically hold talks between their foreign ministries and to better cooperate on defense and security. Seoul and Prague will work together in the areas of railway and highway construction, which will in effect help Korean firms expand their business in Europe. There will also be more exchanges of dialogue, data and people in the areas of cybersecurity, trade and investment, nuclear energy, culture and education. According to data by the Korean government, trade volume between the two countries reached $2.4 billion last year, and Korean firms invested and accumulated $1.5 billion until the end of 2013. The Czech prime minister, who arrived with a large business delegation, promoted the soundness of the Czech economy and its favorable business environment. President Buck, one of whose diplomatic goals is to promote and secure external support for North Korea and unification policies, certainly brought the matter to the table. Referring to how the Czech Republic witnessed that reforms and opening up its market were the only ways to rebuild the economy and improve quality of life, she said the Czech case could send a clear message to North Korea to choose the right path to change. The Czech Prime Minister then officially invited President Buck to visit Prague in the near future to carry on the momentum for bolstering their cooperation set by his visit. Choi Yusun, Arirang News.
We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. A senior U.S. official has stressed that a controversial U.S. missile defense system that may or may not be deployed in South Korea is purely defensive and would solely be designed to counter ballistic missile threats from North Korea. Speaking in Tokyo this week, Frank Rose, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Defense Policy and Verification Operations, said the so-called THAAD system would only be used to defend against short and medium-range regional ballistic missiles from Pyongyang. Rose added that Russia and China should not feel threatened by the deployment of such a system. His latest comments come amid rising complaints from Moscow and Beijing. They say the deployment of THAAD to the Korean Peninsula would threaten their national security. North Korea has decided to up the salaries of workers at the Kaesong Industrial uh, complex by about 5%. South Korea, which uh, was not consulted prior to the decision, says Pyongyang's move is unacceptable. Connie Kim has more. In a unilateral move, North Korea has decided to raise its workers' wages at the Inter Korean Joint Industrial Complex in Kaesong starting from next month. Seoul's Unification Ministry said Thursday that Pyongyang sent a fax message stating that the minimum wage for North Korean workers would be raised to 74 U.S. dollars from the current $70.35. Additionally, it also plans to collect overtime payments as Social Security. Since opening in 2004, the Kaesong Industrial Complex has been a symbol of inter-Korean economic cooperation, but Pyongyang's latest action has disappointed Seoul. The South Korean government is calling on North Korea to improve current systems at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, such as negotiating wages through mutual consultation. South Korean companies at the joint complex also say a wage settlement is crucial, as the hike will likely burden their management systems. Seoul has offered to meet next month to discuss the issue further, but North Korea declined, only making matters worse. Although the South Korean government says it'll continue to push for a meeting, analysts doubt it'll happen considering the timing. South Korea-U.S. joint military drills are set to kick off next week, despite strong opposition from the North. Experts say that Pyongyang's intention lies in getting an upper hand over Seoul in making decisions at the Kaesong complex, which has been a significant source of income for the North since its opening. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, one place where wages won't be rising, this year at least, is South Korea's Samsung Electronics. Samsung says it is freezing salaries this year as the firm struggles to bounce back from plunging profits. In a statement on Thursday, Samsung said the wage fix is to strengthen its competitiveness given that business conditions are, quote, not optimistic. The firm's mobile division, its main cash cow, so its profits dropped more than 60% on year in the fourth quarter of last year, with overall net profit falling more than 20% on year in 2014. Samsung's pay freeze is the first in six years, but it will not apply to individual incentives or bonuses. Almost one in three people across the world now own a smartphone. U.S. researcher Strategy Analytics says the number of smartphone users exceeded 2 billion for the first time last year. That's a 37% jump compared to 2013. And the number is still rising, as you'd imagine, really, with more than 2.5 billion expected to be using these kind of devices by the end of this year. Korea is certainly contributing to this trend. Google says Korea's smartphone penetration rate is the second highest in the world at 80%, trailing only Singapore. Now you better watch out because Apple will host an event on March 9th that's expected to announce the highly anticipated details of its smartwatch. Invitations to the surprise event say simply spring forward that phrase and the event's date hint at the official unveiling of the Apple Watch 
as Americans will be turning their watches an hour forward for the start of daylight savings on March 8th. Key details such as full pricing information and battery specifications remain unknown, but the watch is scheduled to launch in early April. The smartwatch was first revealed by Apple last September during its iPhone 6 launch. Tobacco companies in Korea will soon be forced to cover more than half of the surface of their cigarette packs with warning messages and pictures showing the harmful effects of the habit. The legal revision passed a parliamentary health committee on Thursday and is going to go before a full session next week. Son Jung-in reports. Anti-smoking messages cover just 30 percent of cigarette packs sold in Korea and are only written warnings which are easy to ignore. In line with the government's tougher policy on smoking, the National Assembly's Health and Welfare Committee voted for passage of a revised law that forces cigarette companies to use pictures showing the harmful effects of the habit and written warnings that together should cover more than 50 percent of the packaging. The law also seeks to penalize tobacco firms found to be breaking the rules. They would face monetary fines of up to 9,000 U.S. dollars, be banned from doing business or put company officials behind bars for up to a year. The revised law will become final if it gains the approval of the full parliament in a session scheduled for March 3rd. The revision is in accordance with the recommended standard for cigarette graphic warnings issued by the World Health Organization. As of last July, 179 countries had adopted the measure, with Korea being one of them, but the rules have yet to be put in place. If the law is passed in Korea, the visual warning system will become mandatory after a grace period of 18 months. Officials in favor of the move say such warnings are one of the most effective anti-smoking measures across the world. Brazil, for instance, saw its smoking rate plunge by 10 percentage points to 22 percent one year after the law was implemented. According to data by the OECD in 2014, the smoking rate for Korean men was 38 percent, the second highest in the world after Greece. Earlier this year, the Korean government raised cigarette prices by about $2 a pack in a bid to reduce the smoking rate. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following this Friday morning from Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. The infamous IS executioner, dubbed Jihadi John, has reportedly been unmasked. The wanted man, featured in several IS videos decapitating weapon, uh, Western hostages, has been identified as Londoner Mohammed Mwazi. The Washington Post first reported that the 26-year-old was born in Kuwait but that he had been raised in a middle-class suburb of West London. He attended the University of Westminster and graduated with a computer science degree. Friends believe he had become radicalized shortly after graduating in 2009, at which point he came under the radar of Britain's domestic intelligence service, MI5. Unnamed U.S. government sources later confirmed the Daily's identification, but the London Metro Police has remained mum. Jihadi John first rose to notoriety in August of last year when he first appeared in a video with American journalist James Foley. He was identified by his British accent in later videos, including those with American journalist Stephen Sotloff and British aid worker David Haynes. At least six Canadian teenagers have left their suburban homes to fly to Turkey to join the Islamic State in Syria. That's according to the Montreal Daily La Presse, which reported that the group of men and women aged 18 and 19 left on January 16th to Istanbul, though it was unclear whether they had reached their final destination. Meanwhile, on the case of the three Brooklyn men arrested in the U.S. for supporting the extremist group, Cordon documents show that there had been a discussion of hijacking a commercial plane and diverting it to IS territory so that they would gain a plane. 
The Ukrainian army has begun withdrawing heavy weapons from the front line in the east, this according to the country's defense ministry. It said it was abiding by the truce brokered in Minsk on February 12th and that foreign observers will monitor this first step. The move follows claims by pro-Russian separatists that they had already begun to pull their weapons, though this has yet to be verified by monitors on the ground. It also follows a noticeable lull in the fighting. Ukraine's military said it saw no fatalities in the past 48 hours, though several soldiers were wounded. Meanwhile, America's top diplomat John Kerry is set to meet with his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov on March 2nd in Geneva to discuss regional issues. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with the 2015 Honda LPGA Thailand, which kicked off its first round of play on Thursday as the Koreans look to continue their dominance in the 2015 season. But the Koreans struggle a bit overall on the first day as Brittany Lang, Stacey Lewis and Yanni Sang take the lead at six under par, while only two Koreans and Emi Dim and Amy Young make the top ten, shooting a four under par tie for fourth place. Meanwhile, Kim Hyo Ju made her season debut in the LPJ, struggled shooting an even par, and is tied for 40th place. Now, even though the two time Olympic gold medalist Lee Sang Hwa might not be competing in the winter, uh, National Winter Sports Festival, many had their eyes on Park Seung Hee, who converted from short track to speed skating just last October. And she didn't disappoint during the 1,000 meter event as she finishes with a final time of 1 minute 20.14 seconds. Good for first place overall. Now, despite the fact that she just recently converted to speed skating, it's her second gold medal overall in speed skating, but her first gold medal during the National Winter Sports Festival as she hopes to continue her success leading up to the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Games. Now, Park Ji-sung is flat-footed, but still ran like he did and did a great job on the pitch. And because of that extra mile he went to become a great footballer, he gets the respect that he deserves. Now, Squawka.com, an English-based football website, had an article talking about some of the best Asian footballers to play the EPL. And in the same article, they listed Park Ji-sung, calling him arguably the best Asian player to play in the EPL. Meanwhile, the article also named Swansea City midfielder Ki Sung Yong as they praised his passing skills and his 89% successful passing rate, which is ranked amongst the best in the league. Now, the Pittsburgh Pirates might be known amongst the Koreans as the team that signed Kang Jong Ho, but did you know the team also has the most number of former KBO players on the team? Well, now aside from the former Nexon hero Kang Jong Ho, two other former KBO players are currently on the 40-man roster, including Radimus Lilies, a former LG Twins pitcher known for his blazing fastball, and another player who signed a major league deal, a minor league deal. Check that. This past offseason is former Tucson Bears pitcher Chris Volstead, who is looking to make the cut after spring training, as all three players will get a chance to play against each other during their inner squad game on March 3rd. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, the last cold snap in spring will continue to sweep the peninsula today, bringing down the sensory temperatures to nearly minus 10 this morning here in Seoul. Uh, in fact, except Jeju Island, the rest is waking up to sub-zero morning lows, so uh, be sure to dress in extra layers before heading out today. The winds are adding a chill to the air. Now, that winds, though, actually swept away all the lingering dust from the nation, and we should have good air quality throughout the day and as we can see there's nothing hovering over the peninsula so mostly sunny skies will be featured all day long so it would have been a perfect conditions to be outdoor if the readings were on the pleasant side but the daytime high here in Seoul will only climb to three while the top temperatures in Daegu and Gwangju rise into five and Busan makes it to seven and as for the other regions Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of five and three and Tokyo gets up to one. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at 7 a.m. Korea time. Enjoy your Friday and have a great weekend. Goodbye.